Um, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you may be, and welcome. My name is Jason Nguyen, and I am the host for today's Daniel's lecture, Surfacing Work by Jia Yi Gu. First, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wenda, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississauga of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home of, to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Um, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Many of us are immigrants or descendants of settlers. And as the indigenous scientist and environmentalist Robin Wall Kimmer writes, being a good neighbor includes an ongoing commitment to compassion, respect, and action for the lives and lands that surround us. We recognize that people are joining from around the world as we proceed under the guise of the new normal. We encourage you to research and honor the indigenous history of the land that you call home. We are grateful to all those who came before us and we honor indigenous communities by actively participating in truth and reconciliation. Uh, joining us today is Gia Gu. Uh, Gia is an architectural historian, educator, and curator who researches, thinks about, and writes on minor institutional spaces, ethics of care, and labor in architectural practices. She is a PhD candidate in the Critical Studies and Architecture Program at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she also received her MARC degree with distinction in the Alpha Rho Chi Medal. Her doctoral research considers the instrumentality of models in the post-war architecture office as demonstrations of architectural expertise. Her work has been recognized and supported by UCLA, the Graham Foundation, and the Canadian Center for Architecture. In addition to her scholarly career, she is actively engaged in institutional and design practice. From 2015 to 2020, she served as director and curator of materials and applications in Los Angeles. In 2020, she will assume the directorship at the Mack Center for Art and Architecture. She is a visiting faculty member at the California College of the Arts and is currently teaching the architecture and media course here at Daniels. She is co-director of Spinagu with Maxi Spina, a research and design studio that explores architectural ideas and processes through spatial, material, and curatorial projects. The format for today's event will be a presentation from Gia with time at the end for questions and answers. This lecture is being recorded and broadcast on our YouTube channel. Please turn off your camera if you do not wish to be recorded. We ask that you kindly mute yourself during the presentation. During the Q&A, please type in your questions uh, in the chat. Alternatively, you can identify yourself in the chat as someone who wishes to ask a question and we can unmute you. I would now like to invite Gia Gu. Thank you, Jason. Um, Thank you, Jason, for the introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be a colleague of yours when you are here in Los Angeles. And I'm so delighted that you are joining Daniels um, this year as um, a new um, tenure track faculty. So I want to first thank Jeanette Kim for the invitation to join the University of Toronto. Um, as Jason mentioned, I'm currently teaching the architecture and media course. And more generally, I'd like to thank Mason White and Vivian Lee for the invitation to present my work today. Um, I should mention that today's lecture is really focused on a particular small aspect of my practice, um, Spina Gu. I think of it more as 25% of what I do in the world, um, but one half of 50% of Spina Gu is really missing, which is Maxi Spina. Um, I, Maxi is really a driving force behind much of the work that I'm going to show today. I wanted today's presentation to function in a number of ways. First, to function like many lectures do as a survey of recent work that I've been engaged in, thinking about and building up as part of um, the relatively young practice Spina Gu. Um, I also want it to be a kind of opportunity of self-reflection. So I, um, I think that there'll be some moments in which I'll um, maybe break out from the formal presentation mode of the lecture. And I'm always happy at the end to engage with thoughts from the audience. Um, you know, I, so just to quickly say, much of my other work deals with institution building, working on um, and building up an organization materials and application. I'm going into another organization coming up in January, 2021, Max Center for Art and Architecture. So I also think a lot about the role of institutions in architecture. And I think a lot about, um, let's say, um, historiographic work. That's part of my doctoral project. 
Um, but if anyone has questions about these, I'm happy to answer at the end. Today's lecture will really be thinking about um, my relationship to design work and thinking about the ways in which design practice can be a, a reflective and interrogative practice. Um, I'm going to be showing four projects that Spina Gu has worked on in the past four years. Um, these are, um, let's say as a studio, we are really interested in interrogating architectural modes of production in order to understand and perhaps sometimes subvert some of the habitual ways we do think and work in architecture. And I don't tend to think of these subversions as very radical, so I'm not trying to claim for novelty or revolution in our practice, um, but really more um, ways in which small thoughts, small commentaries can themselves have a certain agency in undermining um, sort of habits. Many of the works I'll present today explore this relationship between views and viewing, between scenes and screens, in order to turn attention to how techniques of viewing can similarly affect modes of thinking and making and vice versa. The survey of work will span multiple scales and cover a wide range of interests and agendas. So we'll be looking at an object that alternates between an image and an installation. We're going to be thinking about an exhibition that we produced through the sectional view. Um, we'll look at a family house in Argentina that was recently constructed, and then we'll be looking at a proposal we made for a ceramics cafe. Um, we'll start first with um, the image or installation. Um, in the fall of 2016, we were asked to put an installation into a hotel room. This invitation was the result of a last call for installations for One Night Stand LA, a series of exhibitions that put, took place in hotel rooms in a Hollywood Inn. Here's the image of the hotel um, or motel, um, not a traditional exhibition space, as you can see. The event was organized by Jennifer Bonner, Vulcan Alcanaglu, and Kyle Miller. Um, you know, the reality was that you know, nobody really asked us to put an installation in this room, but we were kind of just given this room. We were given a specific brief to think about the installation as a medium for architectural experimentation. On the other hand, to be critical of this medium and to perhaps even propose an end to what an installation could be. Um, and the shape and scope of what the project could be was kind of up for grabs. Um, so a, you know, you could, a text, a film, a performance, an action, a noun, um, a refusal were all viable mo um, for propositions for this space. And by default, everybody who was invited to this exhibition was assigned a hotel room. And our project really kind of began with a naive question, what can we put in this room? Specifically, what can you put in a room that can be understood as a body of work in an installation context, yet is not meant to be an installation or has to somehow refuse the installation mode in order to make commentary on the last installation? And finally, I think a driving question for us was really to ask, what does it mean to show work in a hotel room? Um, all the rooms kind of looked the same. Um, it was all, you know, the only, it was really, the room was the only thing you could see and um, which you could also not unsee. They were kind of like really terrible rooms. And as you move from one room to another, you can kind of see a motif, um, you know, a kind of floral bed perfectly framed by mahogany walls and wilting lamps, a kind of uncombed patch of carpet and sticky electrical outlets, and material transitions between bath, you know, within the room between bathroom tiles or vinyl sheets to carpet or baseboard were really crusty. Um, were like just filled with like human occupant sheddings like hair, flakes, dust, which, you know, black grime. And so like one was not really inclined to relax in the room or to want to even be inside the room. It was really gross. Um, and in many ways, as a space for the display of something that's meant to be an architectural work, it was a really, it was really opposite to a white cube, right? So it was full of, um, let's say, materialities and distractions and imperfections. You were like, what, you know, how do you exactly put something in here or do something in the space? Um, but at the same time, all rooms were treated equal. So we were all given a room and that was the container of our work. Um, so in some ways, a hotel room actually operated, even though it didn't look like a gallery space, it very much operated like a traditional gallery space. It was meant to be ubiquitous, conditioning and seemingly neutral, a seemingly neutral space for architectural display. Um, sorry, let me go. So 
Many of the other architects use the room as a site of their work with glee. So they incorporate props, supporting architecture, screens, containers. They really understood the room as a kind of holder of space, a place where you put something. Uh, we didn't want to put anything in the room. I, you know, we talked about how I sort of expressed how gross we were, grossed out by the room we were. Um, we didn't want to put lamps or screens or stuff. We didn't want to put curtains or postcards. We didn't even want to put ourselves in it. So knowing that the primary reception of the work would be through images, through photographs and Instagram, we wanted to kind of test this verisimilitude of the image. So this is a panoramic photograph of the room using an iPhone um, pan. Already it's containing information about the room, um, its dimensions, interior size, scale of furniture is mediated by this technological apparatus, which is the iPhone. From the iPhone, we began to seam the room in a way. Um, so what we were trying to do was produce a room out of the image of the room. We began to think um, how the room as an image could also operate. You know, the room typically is understood as a background to the work of the architectural object. So we wanted to make it the foreground. Um, you, and, how, you know, we were proposing essentially to construct an image of the room. And by construct, we kind of meant semiotically to construct a, a kind of meaningful um, reflection about what it meant to be in a room, what this hotel room served as a site of display, but also tectonically in terms of making, um, at which point, you know, we were constructing visual scenes of a room that required, required measuring, joinery, seaming, and assembly. Um, we used newish technologies like, you know, surface modeling software like Rhino, really just Rhino, um, and imaging suites to construct an image of the hotel within a perspective box of the hotel room. And we began with the construction of the box itself. Uh, we, you know, we really like, does it sit on the ground? Should it produce a second ground? Is its base triangular? And therefore one would have to negotiate how to fit an image with four walls into a three walled space. Is it five sided rather than three? And therefore you'd have to consider how to divide an image of a four walled space to fit five walls. What happens when the spatial construction of this room as an image, uh, what happens when it doesn't quite geometrically align to the spatial geometry of the box? And so the result was a design and construction of two perspective boxes installed in the door and the window. The boxes allowed visitors to see the rooms without actually ever entering into the rooms, which we found a very satisfactory situation. And it was difficult to Instagram, or at least to understand through Instagram, which we also found really satisfactory. So, you know, when you take a photo of this installation, you actually don't really know what you're taking a photo of because, or you can't see what you're taking a photo of because it just looks like a room as an image. So in many ways, this like, you know, perspective box was kind of resisting its own photography, was resisting a, um, a kind of reception of um, the object. Um, but maybe what was less satisfactory in our work, um, you know, because we put some work into this, um, was that the, the architectural labor we put in wasn't really self-evident. So trained was the audience to see this type of show, in this type of show, to look for the work within the room. Often people, you know, didn't really realize that it was an image of the room and not the room itself. But, you know, on the, you know, on the one hand, we kind of thought maybe the seamlessness between the work and the room is the point. After all, um, this was a project that was no longer trying to make an installation, but trying to make commentary on architecture's conditions of viewing by thinking how views historically and contemporarily are being configured, whether through a perspective box or an Instagram feed, um, but then also how we assemble them and put them together and produce them and what can be perceived um, within the seamless visual artifact. Um, the result of the seeming, you know, we basically applied an image of a three, four walled space into a misconfigured perception box, the perception box, the perspective box um, aligned with one particular ideal point of view, and then the image aligned with another one. So there was a misalignment of image to object. Um, what would happen is that certain well understood surfaces like floors or walls or windows would begin to slip in and out of place and the floors begin to turn and creep into the wall. And the effect of these misalignments serve to undermine a widely held convention of architecture, which is that of course each surface necessarily corresponds to a distinct material and inherent system of a construction. So a wall is stucco or a floor is wood. And so misfitting an image of a room into a room forced us to develop a distinction between geometry and construction perspective boxes as an object and spatial um, construction. So um, really we, we had to constantly remember whether we were constructing an object or constructing an image. And we really liked in the process of producing this, this constant tension between what were we making exactly.
um, the model would have a kind of, or the project would have a kind of second life in, the, in a model. So this is a model that we produce after the fact of the project to kind of help people understand exactly what were the things we made, because of course you kept seeing the image of the room. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see that this is how the perspective box was held up um, and, and, um, and how it fit within the space of the room and what's, you know, what you could see if you could remove the wall. Um, and we, I really like this idea of using a model to delineate the edges of a project since it was so difficult to understand the project, you can kind of see that the, for us, the project was this is, is represented in this kind of relationship between the image perspective box and the room itself. Um, and just a few quick images where um, the, the model began to take on a second life. So this model of the object or the object of the model became um, something that could be itself imaged. And we began to explore the ways in which um, this room began to become instantiated in many, many different mediums. So uh, in the medium of the perspective box and the iPhone photo in the model and then the photograph of the model. So finding ways of instantiating a project through multiple sites has been kind of a key interest of ours. Um, and then thinking about the ways in which like, you know, the, the model has a materiality and how do you show the materiality of the model and allowing the model to open and close and um, photographing and documenting the model itself as an operative object is, um... okay. So room with a view sort of attempted to engineer this relationship between views and viewing. And in turn, the work, you know, helped us present an understanding of our habits and structures of viewing, how producing images or views were constantly working between different modes of perception in digital, real, and exhibitionary environments. Um, in, in some ways for this project, if there was a reference point in which to conceptually situate the practice of what we were trying to do, uh, we would turn to theater historian Arnold Aronson, who used to describe the history of sonography as a pendulum between um, swinging between a battle with space and a battle with image. And for us, we found that this particular project really occupied a self-similar category where we were constantly moving back and forth between space making and image making. Continuing this approach, our studio also has been thinking a lot about the ways in which digital software, digital culture are conditioning our perception and habits and architectural design. Um, and in 2017, a few months after Room with a View, my partner Maxi Spina was invited to produce um, yet another exhibition for SciArt Art Gallery. Um, this exhibition we, um, we called it Thick. It became a mix of a research project and an ex, um, a kind of, you know, exhibition form. Um, and one of the main ideas we were interested in exploring was this idea or role of material thickness as, um, as a kind of um, component of architectural work. So um, the research explored how thickness became this deep structure of design within descriptive spaces like geometry, digital tooling, material fabrication, construction. Um, in some ways, uh, we were really trying to think about the um, ways in which architects would grapple with thickness. Um, thickness itself being a kind of invisible condition that we always have to represent back to ourselves. So whether in the space of a drawing where you'd have to actually draw, you know, in a sectional drawing, you'd have to draw the poche, um, even um, especially in something like Rhino Land, where you have to represent thickness back to yourself by offsetting the actual surface, because of course, in digital environments, thickness, um, surfaces have no thickness, they're infinitely thin. There was a kind of um, interesting ghost to all of the work that we do as architects, which is that we have to constantly build in the representation of material thickness within all of the different sites that we work. Um, and thickness itself is always something, you know, it's hovering in the background. So it's alluded to in section, it's camouflaged in the figure ground, it's presented as a foil in a developable surface, developed surface drawing. Um, but it's also really kind of understudied because of its elusiveness. Um, it really evades, um, you know, when we're doing elevation, it doesn't quite present itself and it really hides that hides a little bit within all of the spaces that we work, especially within these systems of representation that we often um, find ourselves moving through. So in some ways, material thickness, of course, is a, a constructive problem as much as it is a representational one. So in our present day standards of construction, thickness has become synonymous with material offset due to this predominance of sheet material used in construction as opposite to, for example, stereotomy in which thickness is treated through subtraction and the removal of mass. So how do you treat thickness? What, what does one? Um, this condition of thickness, the necessity of thickness really carries no central import in any specific moment in architecture, but it does circulate, as I mentioned, through different moments of architectural thinking. And its condition is linked to, um, of course, 
the emergence of new forms of architectural drawing like the developed surface, um, but also within, you know, classical problems of Doric order, even in the modernist obfuscation of solid forms, it kind of remains unavoidable when you think about the Miesian corner and the Kiesler's, Kiesler's endless surfaces. Um, we started to think about thickness as a consequence of architecture's lack of medium specificity and its constant migration between drawing, tool path, picture plane, screen, between material and assembly. And so we were really thinking about how thickness becomes a tectonic default um, and how this project could potentially think about and present ways in which we could, um, let's say, excavate certain, um, or let's say, bring together certain ideas of thickness and representation and thickness and construction. Um, we started first by thinking about, um, you know, the, this, this surface that we work with in Rhino so often and the kinds of information one can embed within a surface, whether that was the mapping of material, um, a kind of ma material texture um, or the, this, this, this kind of conceptual challenge that we also saw with many of our students, which is that new students coming into art, anybody coming into architecture working in digital software, forgets that what they're working on is a representation that's reflected back on them and not a kind of literal object, right? So, I mean, I think anybody here who's been a student or has been a faculty member teaching design will remember the moments in which a student realizes that a model is infinitely thin and you can't just make 2D it. You actually have to kind of draw it out and think through all the conditions of that surface as a material and therefore infuse dimension, infuse information into the material in order to approximate or build a relationship between the representation and the real. So we were really interested in the ways in which this um, sort of this challenge is conceptual challenge. And um, we were also especially interested in um, how software currently is carrying information between platforms and yet thickness kind of gets drops out of this. Um, I have to go a little quickly because I'm realizing I'm going to run out of time, but um, we started with a series of drawings that tried to explore, um, uh, you know, this relationship between hatching, um, graphic conventions of hatching and the legibility of thickness within drawing and mis misregistration, thinking about how shadow can also become an extension of um, the, um, the legible, how shadows become an extension of the legibility of the post-shaped section. Um, and we were in some ways really trying to think through how you could uh, materialize a misreading of a section in order to produce um, a kind of object whose thickness was um, ambiguous or whose thickness um, was, um, let's say, derived from a series of representational techniques rather than from the literality, literalness of the material itself, the literal thickness. And so um, in what we came, what the consequence was this project that's like kind of familiar and kind of elusive. So we've been told it looks like grandmother's furniture, thanks to Hernan. And um, we've been um, sort of, um, you know, people kind of see it um, as a ruin or see it as um, a kind of, um, uh, um, uh, seeing Vivian joining us. Um, so, um, it, its formal qualities and contorted profiles really demand the view visitor to um, see the installation in the round. We used um, formica laminate to um, approximate the sensibility of wood, but what we were most interested in the formica was the ability to control the directionality of the wood itself, to kind of treat the wood as a hatching. Um, it oscillated between scales of oversized furniture and large objects, and then um, in some ways began to also operate at the scale of a room. Uh, oh, you know what? Um, oh, so this is just an image thinking about um, the ways in which we could think uh, use wood and use the hatching of the wood to approximate um, um, shading or hatching or delineations. Um, and in this way, we could conceive a project that was kind of a rigorous exercise in form and construction um, that could also express certain graphic values that we have um, that we have. Um, that architects use to think or work through a project. And then on the other hand, really thinking about how can specific um, representational techniques drive um, the, um, the production of things like thickness or um, sort of a sensibility of thick or thin rather than only alluding to thickness that is itself an allusion to something out in the world. 
Um, so we were also really interested in considering, you know, this issue of perceived thickness, volumetric th thickness, and ideas of screening and layering um, that would occur within the installation and how to bring that into something more specific like domestic architecture. Uh, around, I think last year, we completed this project Piaggio House, um, which is a um, family house in Argentina. Uh, Maxi, Maxi's from Argentina, so this was pretty close to home. Uh, Piaggio House is the renovation of a two-story um, building constructed in the 1960s um, in the outskirts of Rosario, Argentina. It's a 2,150 square foot home that proposed to transform the typical mechanisms of domestic security and defensive architecture like screens and, and gates into a social infrastructure through which um, we strategically delaminated security gates from glass walls or from um, from apertures to um, essentially thicken the threshold between interior and outdoor spaces. And I'll elaborate a little bit more in, um, a little bit further. So this is the um, Argentinian um, residence. It's a courtyard residence that was designed for an extremely private uh, non-traditional couple who nonetheless loved indoor outdoor living. And the design accentuates this overlapping use of private and semi-private spaces through this layering of recessed volumes and windows and spaces. For the single family home, we face this constraint of a narrow plot within a tightly subdivided urban grid. So the house sits on a 28 foot plot, shares its party wall with its neighbors like many other buildings in Rosario. You can see on the top right, it's really fit in pretty snugly within that lot. Um, it's sandwiched between a 1920s street facing one story house to the west and a recessed two story cottage to the east. Um, and so the buildings, um, the lot itself really only offers us a simple rectilinear form that's punctured on the street and then rear facing facades um, on the back. Um, in the front yard, this composition of openings, um, you can see that what we try to do was essentially, um, while it's only two stories, we try to design it in a way so that there, um, there was this legibility um, of the elevation as almost four virtual levels. So um, we, uh, um, the opening, so these um, punctured windows were a way of kind of um, dissolving the, the reading of the house as a kind of solid mass with just two floors, but really to offer a kind of legibility um, of um, multi-level housing. Um, the house accommodates the rhythms of Argentinian life. So it's three bedroom, two baths, and there's a requisite a sub door, which is a basically an outdoor grill station in the back that um, Argentinians religiously use, especially this particular family. Uh, rooms in the ground floor scheme are organized so that one flows into another from the street to the backyard. Um, it's really a kind of layered um, architectural organization. Um, and once, you know, from one, from one position of the house, you can kind of see through multiple points of the house. The existing house belongs to a typology of single family houses in Argentina called corridor houses, which, um, which is essentially, you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, you can enter the house from the front door, but you can also enter the back of the house, which is typically the social space um, from the side of the garage um, through a long corridor. So there's a kind of deep separation of private and public space uh, within the residential unit itself. Um, you can buy, essentially allows visitors to bypass the interior of the house to arrive at the backyard. And it's a variation of a semi-detached house with um, a kind of within a narrow lot. Sorry, there's construction next door to me. So the scheme essentially continues a layout in a way that um, you know you you can allow visitors to come in and never quite enter into the house itself. Um, as a response to the client's requirements for extra security features like fences, gates, and window grates, elements which are typical of single-family houses in this urban neighborhood, we proposed a strategy which attempted to redefine these kinds of infrastructures for privacy into a framework for social use. So we were, you know, we were really given this challenge. Um, you know, if you walk through this neighborhood, what you'll see is that everybody's kinds of installing chain link fences, um, the wire mesh. Um, you, you, there's like an incredible defensive architecture in this neighborhood that's being um, that's part of this um, need to protect the house. Um, these security devices were really common features of every home. Often a home will require multiple layers of um, such armature to protect, to protect the domestic life of its residents against real or perceived activities of trespassing. Um, but aside from you know, protecting the interior life, these apparatuses, these mechanisms of defensive architecture, like the, the gate you see here, or let's say the, the fence um, on the outside, 
um, they're really integral to the ways in which a house conceals, protects, and divides itself against its neighbors and its context. So even though they're meant to be defensive, they're also in some ways kinds of social, social tools, right? So they kind of define a house in relationship to other houses. So it, they would begin to define a kind of neighborly relationship. Um, and, you know, we were really interested in the fact that many of these security devices were kind of um, uh, treated as add-ons, as accessories, or merely ornamental to a house. They were prosthetic features to the architectural design rather than integral aspect of the social function of the house and its position in the urban fabric. So what we were trying to really look at is how can we turn these necessary security mechanisms into an opportunity for, um, uh, um, for social infrastructure. Um, so in the house, we essentially design a strategy of layered voids um, with, a sep with the security device separating from um, the glass. So typically security devices, of course, you, you know, you know, you'll attach it directly um, um, to the glass and then, you know, it'll just become a kind of like claustrophobic environment. What we wanted to do here was find opportunities where we could delaminate that security gate from the glass wall itself, which would allow for a, a flexible multi-use space in between. So if you wanted to keep your house protected, you could close it. When you wanted to more be um, use that in-between space, you could open it and you would have a kind of um, a tertiary space for activities. Um, an all sliding door connects dining and living rooms with a veranda and sun deck on the back, which allows for um, access directly to the yard. So it, it's kind of this indoor outdoor patio. On the exterior, the house is clad in white stucco, giving the building a monolithic appearance. Um, the limited, mostly white material palette continues throughout the house. Cement gray ceramic tiles cover the house floors inside and out. Painted drywall was used for interior walls and ceilings, while kitchen and bathrooms are clad in gray veined white Carrera marble. Um, the chamfered corner was a, um, a feature that we um, wanted to include in order to acknowledge this neighborhood's context of pitch roof cottages. So you can see on the left-hand side, uh, most of the neighborhood has these um, particular um, pitched roofs. And um, we really liked the profile of the house um, with this little cut. Um, for us, it read like, you know, a, the favorite page of a book, you would dog ear it. Um, it really recalls, um, you know, uh, like just, um, it, it's sort of like you're earmarking this house in some way. Um, and it also allows us to kind of connect a little bit more seamlessly to the neighboring house. Um, I'm going to close my lecture on a final project um, that was really more propositional. Um, we were um, invited to participate in a competition organized by the Everson Museum of Art and Syracuse University School of Architecture. Um, the project continues our interest in display conditions made possible by architecture and um, thinking about ways of subverting the fixedness of the viewer um, within the work. So the brief essentially called for a novel and active use of the Rosenfields collection within the Everson Museum of Art, which is a collection of hundreds of ceramic artifacts um, that were um, 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 collected by, the, um, by Rosenfields. Um, and the call was to use this collection and to design a regular cafe space or service in order to um, basically to put this collection into use. Um, and our proposal, um, soft surface, soft, sorry, soft service, um, tr sought to use the Rosenfield collection both as a public facing educational resource um, by off, um, sort of put on display, you know, in a, a traditional manner, but also to allow um, a way for museums and cafe visitors an opportunity to par participate in the curation of the presentation on ceramic collection. So what we were trying to do is think about how can you collapse the museological display of a collection, which will inevitably tend to wanna to show the work in a specific manner. Um, and yet at the same time, um, integrate the active use of the ceramics so that as people are using the ceramics, um, it begins to um, interfere with or begins to, um, let's say, um, uh, intervene within the, the more museological system of display. So we try to couple the encyclopedic tendencies of museological displays with the culinary tradition of kaiten sushi. Um, essentially, 
the mobile stations were designed to fit within a landscape of soft seating and dining furniture. So what you're looking at here are um, sort of material pallets from playground rubber and insulation foam, which we envisioned wrapping the furniture pieces with um, so to minimize this kind of hazardous collision of ceramics and hard surfaces, while also infusing the cafe with an inviting and warm atmosphere of playscapes. Um, and what we were hoping, uh, what we were also, um, thinking about were how to alternate or play with these notions of stationary versus rotational systems. So, you know, there's a kind of tension between a ceramics collection under use and a ceramics tension on display. Typically display happens to be static. You put it on a wall. Whereas when you're thinking about the use of ceramics within a cafe, it's always something put into circulation, right? It goes from the customer um, to the table, table to the bus tray, bus tray to the dishwasher. So it's always in motion in some way. Um, and we were really um, interested in this idea that you could maybe activate the circulation of that object and its use and incorporate it within this display itself. So um, what we proposed were that this um, ceramic pieces from the encyclopedic wall that you see on the back might exchange positions within the mobile system of the cafe as they move from stationary placement into circulation in the cafe. So kind of like the sushi, you, you know, this, hap this occurs of course within Kaiten Sushi where the um, circulation of the food becomes itself part of the spectacle of eating. Um, but beyond the novel effect of ceramics on rotation, the system of display also invites visitors to experience the collection through the cafe's activities of ordering, serving, and busing. So coupling the activities of consumption with the activities of curation. And these two display schemes present an opportunity for both curators and visitors alike to curate through selection and arrangement, putting material, color, form, and silhouette into both intentional and accidental contrast with one another. So in some ways, what we were also interested in was can the customer be a curator rather than have a kind of um, um, totalizing control over the display system, the ways in which the customer would pick their food or pick their coffee or drink would also invariably enter into the display of the ceramics itself. So that in some ways, the everyday use of the work of art inevitably reorganizes the canon. Okay, so that was the last project um, that I was hoping to show. Um, I um, was really, as I made this lecture, I was like, oh, I gave it a title, so I should speak to the title. Um, so I was, you know, one of the ideas about surfacing work is that, of course, a lot of Spina Gu's projects really thinks about and works upon surfaces and architecture. So whether that's materially through these soft surfaces or whether it's thinking about the ways in which surfaces are re-represented back to us on the screen or within scenes of um, a perspective box. But in some ways, I also thought about this um, um, particular title in terms of a kind of labor that I'm personally very interested in, which is how to make visible certain processes or works that are, let's say, um, how to make visible certain forms of invisible labor. So I'm always somebody that's more interested in talking about the back end of something, whether that's institution building, whether that's teaching, whether that's writing history, um, more often than I unfortunately am um, interested in talking about the front end of things. Um, and so I, um, I really sort of um, want to kind of end at that, which is so much thinking about the works, what's the invisible labor of architecture. Right now, this lecture has been about design, but I'm, you know, Jason and I maybe in conversation can go into other areas of invisible labor. Should I close my screen? You are muted. Sorry, you can you can keep it open because I think um, should you desire to make reference to things um, to things later, um, I should say thank you very much. Uh, it brought me a bit of nostalgia for my days in LA, especially the oh. first project, given that I used to live near Hollywood Boulevard. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> Pat. <laughs> um, I should say for everyone out there in the Zoom space. Um, for the Q and A, we'll have we'll have some time here for Q and A, um, and you can type your questions into the chat. I can certainly moderate. Uh, if you, as I said previously, if you'd like to um, identify yourself as someone who'd like to ask the question yourself, you certainly are able to do so, and we can unmute you. Um, I guess I can. Um, I can maybe ask a first question. I should say I I thought it was fascinating, um, and I know you from 
more the scholarly side of things. So it was super fascinating to see this other side. Um, one thing I thought that was really interesting, I suppose was this like triangulation, like certainly aspects of vision, as you said, or visibility were are, are super central. And I thought that there was an interesting connection, as you said at the end between like architecture, this category of curatorial practice, like in, in the way, I guess, like toward the end that I was saying that the way you were in thinking about vision was a, some some way of like curating vision yeah. in some category and aspects of certain kinds of, maybe I mean technique more than technology, but I guess you mm -hmm, could think mm -hmm. of both. Because mm -hmm. right, like the first project that I thought was really fascinating, the use or the turn to the one with the hotel room, you know, the way you use like an iPhone or certain models or even Instagram, it was an engagement with certain kind of techniques or technologies of vision or viewing to kind of like subvert a kind of way of experiencing, mm -hmm. like the spectator was, was subverted or in the second with like rhino fabrication modeling, even engineered materials perhaps. Um, you know, whether it's with privacy and vision for the third or aspects of display for the last. And, and certainly I, I had written before you even talked about it, the aspect of labor. When you're talking about the cafe, the way that labor yeah. and, and consumption are, are not collapsed, but placed in dialogue. And I was wondering if you could like speak what, to some of that a little bit, specifically maybe like vision as curated curatorial vision within its engagement with like aspects of architecture and technology or techniques maybe mm -hmm. yeah i think we, we i you know i think we always tend to think about um the certain habits that are ingrained with certain practices so often this idea of curation which i encounter so often so much in my work is that the act of curation is primarily the selection of work. So the connoisseur model of curation and then putting that work into visible relationship with one, one thing to another or one thing, so on and so forth. But, mm -hmm. and especially in architecture because I, I think architects have a less evolved history in relation to cu the curatorial act, right? Mm -hmm. So often what ends up happening is you'll just see that the treatment of an exhibition or the treatment of um, any given presentation of work is really to limit one's understanding of work to the presentation of an object or image or whatever representational system you want. Um, whereas less often do I find projects in architecture dealing with curation thinking about the exhibitionary format or the mode of exhibition as a conditioning, um, um, let's say, mode of either viewing or understanding a body of work. So mm -hmm. I think that was the case, especially with the hotel room, which was that the tendency was to put something into a room, right? And yet nobody was really asking like, what was this condition of the room and how did the room condition our understanding of these works or how did this room condition the very fact that we're displaying architecture? What does, is it saying something about architecture? Is it saying something about a specific practices body of work? And so in that case, that one project, which was a really difficult project because I personally love it, but it makes no sense to most people because <laughs> it's so like, it just keeps going in like, as one chain of thought and it keeps going down a line of thoughts. Um, and, and so that was sort of it was that um, while curation of course is about this um, imagined viewer of an object, an imagined viewer of an exhibition or a set of relations produced through the exhibition, it, it is also very much um, a practice of um, the production of exhib exhibitionary systems, exhibitionary formats. So whether there's a wall label, whether this is a, something outdoors, whether this is something indoors, it's on a screen, these are just as important um, in the generation of meaning within a body of work as the work itself. And I think that's what some of these other projects have been trying to work through as, as a thought. Well, one of the things I think it certainly highlights, which is fascinating, I feel like in the world of, in more, museum practice, mm -hmm. um, when people think about curatorial practice within the, within the context of the museum, it's like almost the, the spatial dimension of it is sometimes taken as a given. Mm -hmm. Certainly it's thought about quite a bit in terms of museum design, the, arc of the design of the space. But I think one thing that's interesting is these projects are in many ways are, 
maybe not subverting, but highlighting the spatial dimension of curatorial practice. Mm -hmm. Like they're, 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 they're showing the significance of that. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a question for you um, from, from the Zoom. So, well, I was thinking that I must say like as with cultural institutions, many of which being closed during these, during, during these times out, you know, people trying to recreate curatorial practice in the kind of digital formats. And that's kind of the ways that's being done. I was thinking about that a little bit as you were speaking. Um, I do have a question from someone who, which is a little bit uh, not specifically related to this, but wanted to know a bit about um, some of your scholarly work uh, as part of your PhD and some of the ideas that you're excited about there. Uh, and certainly I know quite a bit about some, a lot of your institutional works, but I think it certainly relates in terms of your interest in like institutions and institutionality, modes of representation, understood very broadly in terms of whether representation of labor, model making and art artistic forms of representation. Um, so perhaps you could speak a little to that as well. My, my scholarship? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so my dissertation work is looking at the production of models in Eero Saarinen's office, um, really from 1948 to 1961. And um, I, a, a lot of my, let's say, motivation in that work is not to try to articulate um, a facticity to the model. So not trying to illustrate the role of the model and it's um, uh, the way it's, I'm much more interested in the question of how the model becomes a tool for problem solving and what was problem solving in this particular moment. So one thing about the, um, the history I'm trying to write is that this notion of problem solving, this fact that this, this cognitive action that we assume architects and many designers to have was a kind of um, central part of national discourse in the 1950s. That's of course tied to like all the histories and ideologies associated with um, the militarization of the United States around World War II and also this kind of a Cold War um, competition between um, the USSR and the United States um, and, and how in many ways the Cold War was also conditioning um, some of these um, redefinitions of human thought, human thinking, human psychology. And mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to do is kind of couple the history of psychology and subject creation with the use of the model within architectural practices. Um, so, um, so often when I say I work on model histories, people think I'm like talking about models as like how they represent a building. Um, I, I think in other, like exactly in some of the other ways that we think about the work in Spina Gu, I'm trying to subvert that common, that common narrative that it's really more a question of how have we arrived at this understanding that the model represents buildings and how has the model so um, effectively come to be received as a representation of a building and how are the, you know, just you can remember, you can see the images of like every major architect pointing to a model and um, yeah, so that's just to wrap up quickly, that's where that scholarly work is, uh, which seems to have no end because archives are not open. <laughs> um, yeah. Then my, so that's taken like, a, I mean, I love that work and I'm eager to um, finish it. Um, the institutional work I do and I think about a lot are what are the kinds of propositional institutional spaces that architects um, architecture should have. So um, again, this is about looking at what is existent in our current present day and what other forms of institution making could, could we have. So I'll just say uh, one of the seminal pieces, I think we've read this together, Jason, um, David Jocelyn wrote a piece called Size Matters, which talks about the role of small architecture institutions or small art institutions. And I read that text and I um, was really um, drawn to this one idea that he proposed, which is that the institution is a proposition, that every institution is a proposition about um, something in relation to what it's showing. So in architecture, you could look at things like um, uh, the cast collection at Carnegie Mellon as a proposition about what architecture is and how you study architecture, that you would study architecture as a composition of ornamental facades rather than study architecture as this idea of novelty. Right, and then you move from this around the same year. Bauhaus emerges, and Bauhaus was an institution that was like, we don't need to study cast um, plaster casts. We need to study. We need to understand architecture as a scientific study of um, 
uh, of, of um, progress. So actually it's about novelty. And in the Bauhaus, what we know is that they didn't study history. There was no history. So that's a proposition that architecture doesn't need history in order to kind of reproduce itself as a discipline. And then if you move to the present day, you can think about um, institutions like, um, I don't know, I'm just gonna use materials and applications because that's the one I think a lot about, but like materials and applications, which is similarly an institution that has a history thinking about the role of architectural ideas and how these ideas are both propositions but necessarily need to be realized in the real built work. So materials and applications is really dedicated to helping architects realize their ideas in installation pavilions, one-to-one -one full-scale objects, right? So, that, so that's kind of a proposition that architects build but also architects experiment through building so on and so forth. So I, you know, those are the, the things I think about a lot are like, I, I actually think we need way more institutions in architecture and that the ones that we have right now are extremely conventional and that architects could actually acquire skills um, in institution building and organizing. I think there's exciting things happening now like Dark Matter University, um, a number of other kinds of like organizing and even architecture lobby, which are all in newer institutions, unfamiliar institutions, barely institutions because they were kind of refuse a sense of authority that institutions suppose have, um, but are starting to think about like, what are other ways of instituting an architecture? What are other ways of like, um, you know, motivating and gathering and organizing people and perpetuate meaning through that? It's a lot. <laughs> I know, sorry, I have a lot of ideas. No, 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 I think it's great. I mean, I guess, did you have a few, like the things that you said, one thing that you had mentioned, which, um, you know, when you were talking about your doctoral research, um, in terms of, you know, looking at how model making, in this case, within the context of Saarinen, or even when you were mentioning um, Carnegie Mellon or the Bauhaus, or these certain institutions that were proposing specific kind of techniques of research and also techniques of architectural practice, that in many ways right there, are, one can use them to help diagnose certain broader anxieties and culture, mm. and politics, mm -hmm. et cetera it's Cold War politics, mm -hmm. all of the issues of the 1930s, which like is just like would open the floodgate, certainly uh, like the 1920s, 1930s. Um, I was wondering like in terms of either your own work, whether in terms of subversion of institutions or not, maybe not subversion, but like provocations to institutions, but also some of the kind of techniques that you're engaging in your own practice. I was thinking, you know, sort of like mobile technology, Instagram, not to go into Instagram, of course, but like some <laughs> of the, I, I just mean like, uh, certainly we're in a very anxious mode, I think more broadly. Um, I mean, would you go so far as to categorizing some of the kind of broader anxieties that like some of your provocations speak to? Not to be so like, I mean, I yeah. think- that, be over deterministic, but um, I mean, I I think you know a lot of my own can't speak for Maxi. A lot of my own history is really informed by feminist thought, and how mm. feminist thinking is really interested in invisible forms of labor or reproductive labor. And so right. I think that what the techniques you're talking about, it really it reminds me of um, um, an idea that was circulated in um, last year summer at. A, event I was at called Formats of Care. And Formats of Care was really asking us to think about not what we do as designers or creatives, but how we do things, like how we move through the world, how we structure relationships, how we structure protocols and institutions. Um, I think that's essentially the, the core of what technique is, right? How one does it. And um, I think that also essentially is a question that's always hovering in the back of my mind. So like, you know, that's the umbrella under which I work is like, how do we how do we do this and how can we do it differently if it's not working or how can we do it in a way that's as reflective and interrogative, right? I think that the places that we should probably be interrogating the most like institutions and design practice are the spaces that have very little opportunities for self-interrogation um, and for self-reflection. Um, and when you do start doing that kind of work, it's often accused as like overly conceptual or really academic. Um, but if we want to in our current moment with you know, all of the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the anti-racist work that's happening in architecture, I think it's like a foundational way we have to move through the world is to ask how we do things and whether the ways in which we do them can change. Um, so, you know, it's, Spinaco doesn't come, it, we never 
are explicitly political, but I think also politics all can appear differently in different places, right? So ideologies emerge in how we do things as much as what we say. Right. I mean, one thing I find interesting in that, in terms of like linking it up to categories of institutional or institutionality more generally, is right, I think post Foucault, et cetera, like one would think of institutions as kind of like holders of knowledge. And certainly there's an aspect of power um, that goes, that intersects with any kind of discussion about knowledge. But I think what you're proposing is actually really fascinating because it's like, it's it's not not about knowledge, but it's also about action in a very particular way. And the, the question of scale is interesting here, right? Because it's not about, it's certainly about ideology in a very particular way, but not in terms of like the organization of dominant ideology. I think I was reading this morning, Helen Molesworth wrote an, uh, like there was an interview with Helen Molesworth in the Washington Post. And I know you're like three hours behind. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I was like, I haven't read that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was on the museum and certainly a lot of the kind of challenges that museums have, that have been leveraged at, at museums um, in regard mm. to anti-racism slash racism. And she certainly proposed, right, like the museums by and large operate on an 18th, 19th century model mm -hmm. of kind of chronicling history. And it, your kind of discussion reminded me a bit of that because it provokes, it's placing a provocation on the institution of not having to be that, not fitting within that model, but doing something quite different that is action oriented, that scale mm -hmm. to not in this kind of amorphous scale. You know, when you think about yeah. the the museum, the university, the mm -hmm. department, right? I think that's really fascinating to think about it. Yeah, experience. I think the challenge with institutions of that size and scale is that they inevitably will neutralize anything they absorb. There's just, mm -hmm. hate to break it to the students who are radicals here, but there's only so much you can really intervene in institutions because they're structured to be reproducing of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what's nice is um, if you, I, I think, you know, I, I grew up in LA, I'm living and working in LA and I don't really want to leave Los Angeles. Los Angeles has a really rich history of artists who have thought through and engaged with institutional critique. So their role is not to um, leave the institution but to begin to produce alternative institutions. And actually Los Angeles has, I think one of the richest art ecologies um, where we have hundreds of small artist run spaces. And sorry, it's the construction. Each artist run space is essentially um, proposition about how an institution can be different and doesn't have to be giant or successful or like huge it itself can be small and propositional and I really like that model of working um, which we don't often embrace in architecture. I do have a question someone is curious um, in terms of the if you could mention again the work that you were referring to in Size Matters. Oh it's called um, I think it's called Size Matters, or is it In Praise of Small, David Jocelyn. Okay, yeah. Um, I think a, um, Common Ground published it from New York. Um, it makes me miss LA. I you know, come back. As a winter. It's, 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 it's like sunny here. <laughs> silly silly don't, Canadians. <laughs> don't tell that to the people in the Zoom space. Where <laughs> <laughs> Um, certainly, well, we can probably wrap up. We only have a few minutes left and I certainly have a few things that I'm so, to broadcast to just um, share some of the upcoming, um, some of the upcoming program. Uh, so I would like to thank, in addition to Gia for our fabulous talk here, um, I'd like to thank the Daniels Public Programming Committee for organizing this year's, um, this year's series. Uh, and to see the rest of the Daniels events this year, just head to the Daniels website and go to news and events. Uh, the next event in our series will be Thinking with Landscape by Elise Hunchcock and will take place on Friday, November 27th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. here within the same, um, here on Zoom. And we hope to see you then. So have a very good day.